Right, thanks. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many of you here. Uh, I made it over here from Utrecht in the Netherlands yesterday. I think I heard some Dutch. Where are the Dutchies? Everybody say Hagelslag. Yeah, yeah, all right, thanks. If you don't know what that means, ask a Dutchie. Um, but um, yeah, welcome everyone um, to this 90 minute tutorial, uh, which is, very, is, is an introductory level tutorial to using Dask. Um, I'll start with a little bit about me. Um, ben already said, my name is Richard. I'm a developer advocate at Coiled. Coiled is the uh, company built around Dask by the founder of Dask, uh, Matt Rocklin. Um, I have a background, to be honest, kind of all over the place. I'm a curious guy. I kind of like to hop around uh, what I do, but I, um, yeah, I have a background in design, communication sciences, research. And at the moment, I'm interested in parallel and cloud computing. Uh, I toy around with some Arabic NLP in my free time, uh, and I love to ferment things. Um, I've got a big jar of miso somewhere hidden in my attic that needs to sit there for another year. Um, I'll let you know how that tastes next year. Um, feel free to connect with me on Medium, LinkedIn, um, or just walk up to me uh, after, the, after the talk. Uh, so in the next 90 minutes, uh, we'll first spend about 10 minutes kind of building some intuition um, around what is Dask and why might you be interested in it. We'll then spend a good chunk of time working through some Dask code, uh, and we'll have some time for Q&A and discussion at the end. Uh, experience says that this never quite works this neatly, and usually they kind of merge, so feel free to ask questions in the middle of the uh, tutorial. I think Ben has a microphone um, that we can pass around. Um, let's make this interactive. Um, your questions will help me be more useful to you. So we'll talk about what is Dask, how can I use it, and then what about any other questions you might have. Um, so to start off with, uh, why are you here? Um, and I'll ask, ask a question first. How many people here use pandas on a regular basis? Okay, almost the entire room. What about NumPy? Scikit-learn? All right, this is a pretty steady, uh, steady percentage. Um, and how many of you run into uh, memory issues with any of those three libraries? Okay, smaller, smaller amount of people. Um, how many of you... Uh, have tried to or use Spark or PySpark. Okay? Cool. Sounds like a lot of you are in the right room. Um, chances are you're here because either your code is running slow, uh, your data doesn't fit in memory anymore, or both, which um, is the worst of both worlds, but that can help. Um, basically, this is a diagram to um, explain when you might want to consider using Dask. On the x-axis, we have data size. Y-axis, we have computation time. Uh, if you're in the lower left quadrant, your data fits in memory. It's running fast enough. Don't bother with Dask. Stay away. Use Pandas. Use NumPy. Use scikit-learn. Um, but if you are running into any of the other issues we just mentioned, so either your code is running too slow, you're running into memory errors, or both, um, Dask is worth giving a try. And to illustrate a little bit of what, a little sort of metaphor of how Dask works, this is a, I'm going to actually try and speed this up even further. Um, this is a video of a uh, Amish community raising a barn, um, literally in a day, about 10 hours to be in fact. And um, I like to always show this to, sh um, illustrate what you can do when a lot of workers, agents, things work together in parallel, right? So this is um, pretty impressive. <laughs> and um, we'll tie this back to how Dask works uh, later on in the tutorial, but kind of keep, keep this um, in mind as to, to illustrate kind of the power of what you can do with a lot of things working on the same thing in parallel. So Dask unlocks the power of parallel computing for PyData users. Um, 
which means that you can process more data in less time. Very simple. We'll get kind of more into the weeds as we, uh, as we go. Um, how does Dask do that? Um, I found this um, a picture of a do-it-yourself uh, distributed computing cluster that someone put together, which I thought was just too epic not to share. Um, this is a very do-it-yourself, uh, low-tech way to create um, a cluster uh, which can uh, process more data uh, than any one of these units alone could ever do by itself. Right? So the idea, um, and yeah, you could get kind of into the difference between parallel and distributed computing, but basically, to keep it simple for now, uh, one core can always do less than more cores. So if we can string multiple cores together, uh, we can process more data, hopefully also faster. Um, if you're unfamiliar with distributed computing, parallel computing, uh, I've written a beginner's guide to distributed computing, which I can recommend, which kind of walks through some basic concepts. Uh, the link is in the slides, and the slides will be shared afterwards. So just to kind of reiterate, why do we want to scale Python? I'm going to start with pandas. I think most of the, the hands that were raised were uh, pandas users. This is kind of very basic pandas code to load a um, one month of New York City taxi data, a single CSV file, uh, which I think is about uh, two gigabytes, um, into memory with pd.readcsv. Basic, nothing new here. Now, if we try to load in all of the data, uh, which is 12 CSV files, 12 months, gets to about 15 gigabytes, uh, that error errors out on my machine because it can't fit into my machine's memory. Um, I and mean, here we run into the fact that Pandas um, is limited to working on a single core. Dask exists to solve this problem, and also many others, as we'll see. Um, and Dask kind of, we'll see later, you can kind of think about it as a parallel computing engine uh, that plugs into PyData libraries, like Pandas, NumPy, Scikit-Learn, and XGBoost. Um, so if this is the Pandas race car, which we all know, we like, we like to drive it, we know how the uh, steering wheel works, where the, where the, where the, the, the gear stick is. Um, it's a great car, but it has these limits on the amount of data that you can process with it. Um, so I just said, Dask is kind of, you can think about it as kind of a parallel engine uh, that can plug into the Pandas race car, um, Pandas data frame. So it's going to look and feel like the same car, uh, but it, it's got a different engine, which means similar API, same look and feel, uh, but all of a sudden you don't have these limits on data size anymore. So here we create a 665 million row data set with Dask, I'll write it to Parquet. Uh, if we try to load this in to Pandas, you either get a memory error or your Jupyter kernel dies or something um, of that sort. Um, but if we read it in with Dask, uh, all of a sudden, uh, we can uh, not only read in the data set, but uh, perform computations over that entire data set. Uh, and as you'll see, slight tweak. Instead of PD, we use dd.readparquet. Uh, and we add a compute call at the end of most uh, Dask uh, computations, um, because Dask is able to process things in parallel by using lazy evaluation. Uh, which we'll talk about in more detail soon. So, again, this is pretty high level, but um, you can think of Pandas plus a Dask engine giving you a Dask data frame. Um, as I said, Pandas processes your data frame or loads it into memory into a single core. Um, Dask distributes this over all of the cores in your machine. That could be four if you have four, eight if you have eight. Uh, and it does that. Uh, literally by uh, chopping your data up into small into pandas data frames that can be processed on each core, and then uh, there's some logic that will uh, bring all the results back um, uh, into uh, into the Dask data frame. So this is faster um, most of the time, unless you're walk working with data that, that already fits in memory on your single core. Then you should just use pandas, uh, and it's scalable. Uh, you can scale this up. Um, to multiple machines in a um, cloud cluster, for example. Uh, so the same Dask code that you write on your laptop locally to scale out to your multiple cores uh, can scale out 
uh, to a cloud cluster. You don't have to change your code at all. And Dask does this for Pandas, but also for NumPy, Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, um, and it's also the parallel engine under uh, a lot of other uh, Python libraries like Prefect and Xarray. So NumPy with the Dask engine gives you a Dask array. Scikit-Learn with a Dask engine gives you Dask ML. XGBoost, you get the point. Um, not only that, so these are kind of the high-level uh, libraries that, uh, um, that Dask offers. Uh, but underneath that, uh, you can go lower level. Um, and Dask offers a lower level API that lets you sc scale any arbitrary Python function uh, for parallel processes, process, processing. Sorry. Um, so there you can take uh, Python code, a for loop that uh, runs sequentially um, and wrap it in uh, Dask delayed. Again, we'll see this in more detail later, uh, but then all of a sudden your same Python code is distributed over uh, all the cores in your laptop or the cores in your cluster. Um, and this gives Dask a lot of flexibility too. So something like Spark is generally more limited to a kind of MapReduce paradigm. Uh, Dask del delayed gives you a lot more flexibility about how you build your own task graphs. Uh, and um, using dependencies from different tasks and things like that. So this is kind of getting in the weeds, but I um, always like to point this out. Now, what is coiled in this whole Dask world? Uh, coiled is a way to run Dask in the cloud. Um, so you can run Dask in the cloud um, by yourself. You can set up your own uh, Dask gateway or Kubernetes and do all of your own security deployments and everything. Uh, but it will probably take you a couple of days uh, you'll have to, to put someone on maintaining that. Um, Coiled offers a paid way uh, to do that uh, for you. Uh, so we can run clus Dask clusters in the cloud, uh, spin them up in a couple of minutes uh, with two lines of code, and then you can run uh, code from your laptop in the cloud in your AWS or GCP account. Um, so we take away the DevOps part of deploying Dask uh, in the cloud. And again, we'll see this in more detail later. So just to wrap up this kind of intuition part that we're starting this tutorial with, um, Dask is an engine for high-performance parallel computing. You can step right into sort of pre-built Dask race cars, right? These are the high-level APIs, uh, Dask DataFrame, Dask Array, Dask ML, um, that parallelize code or data frame or array or, or scikit-learn code for you, so you don't have to worry about how it gets parallelized. You can just sort of step right into it. Or you can go a step deeper and um, build your own parallel uh, uh, task graphs uh, with uh, the lower level API, task delayed. Um, before we jump into the next part of the tutorial where we're going to get uh, to write some task code, any questions at this point? Uh, so, uh, there's not one answer to that. So, for some some things, are, so XGBoost offers a native Dask integration. So you just say uh, you import the Dask dot XGBoost regressor, uh, and that will automatically link up to wherever you're running Dask. Um, Dask ML is a re-implementation, uh, mostly wrappers uh, around Scikit-Learn. Um, Any other questions for now? No, great. Um, then let's write some code. I was very proud of this animation. Sorry, can you all clap for me? That would be great. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, so uh, there was a link in the uh, start, uh, starting slide to a repo. This will take you there as well. Um, there's two ways to run the code during this session. Uh, you can either clone the repository uh, there's a binder directory with an environment.yaml file that you can use to uh, create your local conda environment. Uh, alternatively, you can click on the launch binder button and that will spin up a binder 
uh, notebook for you where you can run the code. Um, so let's get into that. Uh, actually, let me... Yeah, so this is the repository. Um, are folks comfortable with the binder, uh, notebook, or launching? Is any, actually, let me rephrase that question. Is everyone, anyone having trouble finding this repository or getting started with binder or finding the notebooks? Great. In that case, um, we will start with the first notebook, which is the test drive. Um, usually, I run through this notebook and kind of show how it works. I'm going to try something different today and give you all a couple of minutes. Uh, that you can run this notebook yourself, uh, top to bottom. Um, so I'm just going to give folks a couple of minutes to run the cells and kind of get a feel for it. Um, let's say two minutes. And um, after that, I'll run through it myself. And if people have questions uh, right now, feel free to ask them as they come up. Do, we, do you have the microphone? Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. So even with, when I'm on a single machine, I nonetheless go and start like a distributed cluster. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe so I can see the fancy plots and the progress bars and everything. Mm -hmm. But it works even if you don't do that. So I'm wondering, like, what's the difference between in a single machine uh, between starting the cluster or not? Yeah. Uh, so, the, yeah, the question is about, is actually a question about um, the Dask scheduler. Uh, so, the Dask has a few different schedulers uh, that will um, do things like create the task graphs. Uh, I'm going to leave this question for right after this notebook because then we'll, I have a nice diagram that shows the, the architecture of a Dask cluster. But it's a great question, and I'll come back to it. All right. Any other questions after folks run through this? Test drive notebook right now. <laughs> right. The question is how much of pandas is covered in the Dask data frame API? Can you just drop in replacement everything? Um, no, you cannot drop in replacement everything uh, because you're moving from uh, sequential programming to distributed computing. Um, it's really kind of a different universe. You have to think about uh, state, uh, data transfer, uh, data duplicates, things like that. Um, and some things like calculating a median in uh, a distributed setting is actually very difficult. Um, so that's something that um, is 
There are some workarounds in some cases, but you'll find that it's not as easily uh, implemented in the Dash data frame API. Um, so, yeah, how much? I, I can't give you an exact percentage. I if I were to kind of like uh, give a rough estimate, I would say 85%. Um, and the biggest difference, as we'll see in a little bit, is that you, often, you always have to add the compute uh, call at the end. Yeah. All right. So I'll run through this very quickly since you uh, all just ran through this yourselves. But basically, um, we'll start by test driving. Not me. There we go. Yeah. No, there's a piano sound. I hear it too. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Right. So we'll um, import uh, Dask data frame as DD. There we go. Um, run a, a quick script to download some data. Uh, and as we saw before, we can use the read CSV method. Um, with dd instead of pd to read the files. We can call head uh, on our Dask data frame, and we can compute um, group by just adding the compute at the end here. Um, because if we don't do that, we see that Dask is extremely fast, 16.2 microseconds. Um, and that is because Dask hasn't actually done anything. So when you um, instruct Dask to do something like this, all it does is uh, create a task graph, which is sort of like a recipe, a route to say, okay, I know where all the data is, I know how to get to this result, I will not get it until you specifically tell me to, uh, because there might be a situation where this result is too big to store uh, in your local client. Um, so you, this is the difference between pandas, whenever you instruct it to do something, it immediately does it, it's called eager evaluation. Uh, Dask uses lazy evaluation, where it won't actually compute anything until you specifically tell it to. And now it will run the computation and get you the result. So that also means that if you just call the data frame, in pandas here you would see uh, contents of uh, that data frame. Uh, with Dask, all you get is sort of some, some structure, so a schema, uh, information about the column names, the data types, and the number of partitions. And partitions, you can get it from the word, right? Dask cuts your data up into smaller parts, partitions. And each of these partitions, when working with Dask data frame, is a pandas data frame. So each, and that's why uh, Dask can cover so much of the pandas API, is that it's executing pandas operations on pandas objects uh, behind the, the scene and then synthesizing those back. Very kind of lightning test drive. We'll dig into more detail later. Dask array, we'll import it as DA. This will be the similar look and feel as uh, NumPy, except again, lazy evaluation. So you call the array, you don't get the data, but you get some information about it. In array, the parts are not called partitions, but chunks. Don't ask me why. It's one of the things that frustrates me the most <laughs> about Dask. Um, but uh, you know, things evolve, and uh, people get attached. Um, so yeah, here you see it has 100 chunks. The array is made up of 100 chunks. Each chunk is 7.63 megabytes. Um, and then, again, we can call kind of NumPy methods or, or do NumPy operations, but we have to specify the compute uh, to actually get that result uh, done. DaskML, this will be very similar to the scikit-learn uh, API. And I'm not sure why this is taking so long. Did anyone else have trouble running this? You did? Okay. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, these again are, will be Dask arrays that are made as part of a uh, kind of synthetic data generation method we instantiate a Dask uh, ML version of the logistic regress regression model. We fit it on the data, and we can make our predictions. 
Um, and I would say to answer your question again about how much uh, of the API uh, uh, Dask covers, uh, with scikit-learn, I would say it's the, the lowest percentage uh, because not every algorithm can be run in parallel. Uh, so basically, Dask ML runs, um, can uh, work with algorithms that have the n jobs parameter um, that, that are uh, able to be run, run in parallel. A quick test drive of the lower level API that I discussed. So this is Dask Delayed. This is the API that lets you um, create your own parallel uh, Python code. Uh, so here we are defining two functions, uh, one that increments x by one, and one that adds uh, a bunch of variables together. Each one of these function uh, will take a second because we are uh, sleeping for one second. If we run this in normal Python, Guess how long this will take? Three seconds, and we'll have the result, right? Because each function takes a second, so one, two, and then adding them together is another second. Now, if we were to run this in parallel, because the two increment uh, calls are independent, right? You can increment x by one and y by one separate from each other. So you could run those in parallel if Python was able to do that. It doesn't do that by default, but by wrapping it in a delayed, uh, um, wrapping it with a dash delayed object, again, super fast, how did we do it? Um, only the task graph has been built, again. So we, have, we get a delayed object, not the actual result in this case. And on delayed objects, we can call visualize which starts to give us an idea of how the task graph is being built. So A is the increment function with input one wrapped in, a, in dash delayed. So we're calling the function inc, and we'll get a result. Squares are results, and um, circles are tasks. B is the identical task graph. It's the, the function inc being called once, and C will look like this. So they're read from bottom to top. Um, two ink calls that can be run in parallel that feed into an add call that will give us our final result. So quick check. How long will this take to run? I hear two and I hear three. Who says two? Who says three? Two seconds. The two ink calls run together. Um, this, of course, depends on how many cores you have in your laptop. If I only had one core, this would still run in three seconds. Um, luckily, we're beyond that state of technology. But if we now add uh, another variable, d, then we get three calls to ink. And this will run again in two seconds, because I have eight cores in this machine. So I could go up to eight calls of ink, and this would still run in two seconds. Beyond that, it will um, take more, more time. So this is a very simple task graph. This is nice. We all get it. Uh, things can get a lot more complicated. Um, people tend to have two different reactions to these task graphs. They find them either intimidating or exciting. Um, no judgment on what your reaction is. Uh, if you find them intimidating, the good news is Dask data frame, Dask array, Dask ML, you never have to worry about building your task graph. Dask does that under the hood. It's optimized. Good luck trying to do it better. If you are working with uh, use cases or projects that don't fit into a data frame or an array model, or sometimes do and sometimes don't, um, or you think you can beat Dask, uh, you can use Dask Delayed to build your own task graphs. And finally, um, we talked about uh, running Dask in the cloud with Coiled. Um, we'll illustrate this uh, at a few times in, uh, in this tutorial. If you want to run uh, the code below, uh, you can create an account uh, at, at cloud.coiled.io. You just need to put in your GitHub or your uh, uh, Google credentials. and You'll instantly have an account, so no sort of credit card identification and anything like that. Um, and then uh, you can um, run the following commands, open a terminal, create a new environment, 
uh, install this meta package, which will get you Dask and Coiled and everything you need, sorry, this one. Um, and then run, run Coiled Login. The Coiled Login will prompt you to put in a token. Um, I've made this token available for this tutorial um, so that normally you'd have to set up your own AWS or GCP account, but just so that we could all, if, if people are interested here right now, they can try it right now. You'll all spin up in my account, uh, so I'll pay for all of your cloud costs. Um, but after today, you'll have to pay for it yourself. Um, so we can uh, import coiled um, and run this cell. Actually, did I run this? I don't think I did. Okay. Um, to spin up a coiled cluster. Um, so here we are spinning up. Um, this account is set to work with AWS. So in, in my AWS account, we are currently spinning up a cluster with 20 workers that have uh, 16 gigs of RAM each. Um, a Docker image will be loaded onto each worker. Uh, we've built that Docker image up here. Uh, it's called a coiled software environment. Um, and this is launching now. Um, so we can see okay, provisioning the resources, the instances are booting, and then it'll launch the software environments. This will take about two or three minutes. Uh, and once this is done, uh, you can run, you can connect Dask to this cluster, um, and any Dask code that you run in this notebook uh, will not be run on your laptop, but will be run on the cloud. Um, so if you want to give this a spin uh, while we wait um, for the cluster to launch, uh, I'll leave the instructions up here. Uh, we'll have uh, again, two minutes um, for folks to try that out. And if uh, there are any questions, I'm happy to take those now. Yeah. If I understand that correctly, in like this distributed cluster you just showed, mm -hmm. the runtime environment that the worker will use is defined by the Docker image that you provide. Yeah. Which Correct. means that if you wanted an additional dependency, you would have to update the image accordingly. Yeah, thank you for pointing out my biggest frustration with our platform at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. And we're working on um, uh, a way to not have to do that anymore. So to be fair, this is already a big step forward, right? Having to build your own Docker image and distribute that on a cloud cluster is a lot of work. The fact that you can do that with two cells of code is a step forward. Uh, but it's not yet as flexible as we want it to be. Uh, so, our, yeah, our, uh, we, we're a startup. Our product is iterating every week. Um, we just have put in a, a, a PR um, that works with poetry uh, instead of uh, to, to try and see if we can um, build something where you can just add uh, dependencies uh, while your cluster is live. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe as a quick follow-up, what would be your recommended strategy right now for a multi-user setup where every user possibly has their own environment? Because the best thing we could come up with is having each user like spin up a large compute resource and having Dask run locally mm -hmm. on, on that resource, which is not distributed in the classical yeah. sense of the word, but it gets the job done. So do you have a, an, an idea how we could like make it better? Um, so can you um, say the first part of your question again? Yes. So, a multi so rather than having like each user spin up their own DAS cluster mm -hmm. on their local machine to avoid this problem of you know possibly different environments in the yeah. workers, is is there, an, is there an alternative to that? Yeah, and the problem is that different users need different dependencies. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so in our case, we would say each user builds a, a coiled software environment that works for them and spins up their own cluster. Yeah. Um, I guess, alternatively, you could build an environment that works for everybody, but that seems less flexible and less optimal to me. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions in the back, uh, Ben? Thanks. Do you support uh, Azure as a cloud provider? Not at the moment. Okay. No, we're working on it. Um, we can talk about it afterwards, yeah. but um, not at the moment. Thanks. Another question. You haven't uh, sort of explored the data very much. What do you recommend for visualization? Uh, for large data amounts. Sorry? Yeah, which uh, frameworks do you recommend for visualizing large amounts of data with Dask? Uh, data Shader. Yeah. So Data Shader is built with uh, Dask under the hood. Um, I do, do you know Data Shader? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. I was just wondering if there was anything else, but I guess that's probably what... 
That's what I use. Yeah, yeah that's what I would recommend. Yeah. Okay, so in the meantime, this has completed. Um, we can go to the uh, coiled dashboard in this case. I see that some people are spinning up clusters. That's great. Um, and then yeah, I didn't follow my own advice and didn't put my name in, so yeah, we've got a bunch of insert your name here. Um, but um, th this is our cluster that's running, um, and this is maybe partly also to answer uh, your question. Um, you can have team accounts in Coiled and see kind of an admin can see whose clusters are spinning up. You can set user, user limits to those clusters. Um, and here you can see the software environments that are running. Um, yeah. So now that we have that set up, um, right now if we, still, if we run our Dask code, nothing will happen on our cluster because by default Dask will run your code locally. So we have to tell Dask, instead of running things locally, please connect to this cluster that's running. And to do that, we create a client. Um, and this is, gets to your question, Juan. In this case, we create a distributed uh, um, task scheduler, uh, which will start to communicate to the cluster. And um, if we now read in this data, I think this is my cluster. I hope so. This will start to read in um, the full data set that we couldn't read in locally on my machine before. So this is all 12 uh, CSV files uh, being read in at once. Feel like maybe the in internet connection is a bit slower than I was hoping. Well, I'm gonna run this and then we'll see uh, what we can do. Um, Dask offers a dashboard. Nothing's happening at the moment, so you don't see anything. Uh, this is, um, yeah, again, this would run faster uh, normally. Uh, but this is where you can, um, unlike Pandas, Dask offers you a lot of visibility in the code that's running. So you don't have to look at a Jupyter cell with an asterisk next to it, uh, but you can see the tasks uh, that are running on which workers, the amount of memory that they take up, uh, and things like that. So I'm, Hope I will be able to demonstrate that um, later. Um, but for the sake of time, let's uh, move on. Oh, there we go. Okay. I will do it this way. Okay, love it when things don't do what you expect them to do. Let's move on to the next notebook and then uh, we'll come back to this. Um, this is more to answer your question, uh, Juan. Um, a, a notebook with no code, just to kind of talk about uh, the Dask uh, architecture and some basic concepts. Um, so we saw already you can use Dask to parallelize pandas with similar API. Um, and we also talked about the different collections. So Dask Array, Dask Data Frame, Dask Bag is one that I didn't mention yet, but it's a, a high-level API for working with uh, unstructured data, things like JSON. Um, and then um, you have the lower-level API, which are Dask Delayed and Futures. All of these APIs create task graphs, uh, and these task graphs are run by schedulers. Um, there are technically four schedulers, um, you can forget all of them for today, except for the distributed one. Um, the first three all run only on a single machine, and then they run either threads, the processes, or synchronous. Um, the threaded single machine runner is what you will get by default. Uh, so by default, um, Dask will run things backed by a thread pool. Uh, you can run things with processes instead. Um, but the distributed scheduler um, is what we recommend. Uh, also when working locally. The distributed scheduler gives you access to the dashboard, which is still not showing anything. Um, and um, yeah, is optimized. Uh, and once you use the distributed um, uh, scheduler, so that's what we instantiated here with the client, um, you can run that locally and then plug in the cluster and then your same code will um, run in the cloud. 
So we have a client. Uh, the client is wherever your Python code is running. That could be an IPython session, a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, it could be a prefect task, uh, an Airflow task, a GitHub action. Um, anything that can run Python code can create a Dask scheduler and a Dask cluster. Uh, a Dask cluster is made up of the scheduler uh, that orchestrates uh, all of the partitioning the data and then distributing it and bringing it back. And the actual computation is done by workers. Um, if you're working locally, usually workers will be the number of cores that you have in your machine. Um, once you scale out to the cloud, um, yeah, it's potentially uh, limitless. To kind of go back to our uh, Amish barn raising uh, uh, analogy that we saw at the beginning, um, you're trying to build this big data project, um, and the people who are doing the work are your cores, your Dask workers. They're using Python libraries as their tools, uh, so you have access to, to all the Python libraries that you need. Um, and they do that following a blueprint. That's the task, the task graph that we uh, saw. And you can build that task graph yourself with the low-level APIs, or Dask can do it for you with things like Dask Data Frame and Dask Array. Uh, and then the Dask scheduler is sort of the general contractor who's uh, keeping an eye out uh, on that things are going uh, as effic efficiently as possible. Um, yeah, we saw this at the beginning, but again, uh, we find it really important to iterate that um, you really should not use Dask if you don't need it, right? So using Dask means you're entering distributed computing. Um, one, it's more, co it's complicated, there's a lot of new concepts you need to learn. Two, a lot of things can go wrong. It's very hard to de debug when you're running and distributed. Um, so don't go there if you don't need to. If pandas and numpy are, are, are doing the job for you, stay there. Um, but if you need, if they're not giving you what you need, uh, then Dask is there and um, has been designed to make the uh, transition from pandas to Dask or numpy to Dask as smooth as possible. Uh, there's some more material here uh, that folks can check out um, at your own leisure afterwards. Um, I'm very interested what happened here because, yeah, okay, so this ran, but we missed it. Fair enough. Let's see if we can check that out again later. Um, let's go to notebook two, Dask data frames, um, to dive in a little deeper uh, into the Dask data frame API. I'm just going to check how I'm doing on time. We're halfway, I think. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So some of this we've seen before. So I'll just run these cells um, to read in the same data that we uh, loaded in before. You'll see that um, to load in a DAS data frame, uh, you get this uh, schema with some basic information about uh, the data set, but not the data itself. Uh, this includes things like the columns and the D types. Um, for these things, you don't need to add compute uh, because they are already brought in memory. It's just kind of the schematic information. Um, the number of partitions, in this case, 10. I'm actually curious what happens if we do ddf.visualize. Right. So, this DAS data frame is the result of 10 parallel calls to read CSV. Each um, call is read into one partition, um, which will be uh, a pandas data frame. We could um, repartition this data frame to say, okay, actually I want partitions that are 100 megabytes each. And interestingly enough, Let's see. Right. So each one of these is a read CSV call and then a partition, repartition call. So I mentioned this uh, already in passing, but just to kind of visualize it already, um, the four part parts in this case make up the DAS data frame, and each single partition is actually a pandas data frame, which is why we can use uh, pandas operations on them. Did the visualize already. Um, you can call ahead on a, on a DAS data frame without the compute because it calls, it uses compute under the hood. Um, very similar as pandas. Now let's look at something a little bit more involved. Um, so uh, if we wanted to compute the largest flight departure delay in our data set, um, 
We could do this in Pandas by iterating over each CSV file separately and then joining them together. Uh, and then we could also wrap that Pandas code in a Dask delayed to have that run uh, in parallel. Um, but that's actually what Dask data frame does for you. Um, so we just call max on the uh, departure column, departure delay column. Um, and this, again, won't actually give us our result because we haven't called compute. So this has built the task graph in the background. It starts to look a little more like the barn uh, that we're building. Um, so yeah, we have 10 calls to read CSV. Uh, we're getting a column from each CSV file. We're computing the max over each uh, chunk and then combining, aggregating the max over all of those chunks to get the final result. Um, if we had 10 cores, these could all run um, in parallel. Up until this point, everything is lazy. Uh, we need to call the compute to actually um, trigger the computation. And uh, Dask is smart about deleting intermediate uh, results. So um, it'll clean up files that it doesn't need anymore uh, to free up memory in your cluster. All right. Um, the next section has two examples and two exercises. Um, I'll give folks five minutes to work through those. Um, and again, if there's any questions, um, feel free to just ask them as we go. Um, you just did a repartition, right, of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the data frame. Um, but if you put in a different repartition size, do you, yeah. don't you get uh, less or more partitions? Yeah, that should be the case. Um, let me see, did that not happen? It was uh, also 10 partitions. So that was well, my accident two, then. Two things could have happened. Either it was, let's see. There we go. Oh, well, but now... Actually, let's say... Yeah, no, this makes sense. Yeah, so the, per the partitions were already 100 megabytes. Ah, OK. Um, yeah, makes th sense. Thanks for spotting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so here it's splitting up uh, into 20, because okay. uh, I've now specified 50 megabytes. OK, cool. Thanks. Yeah. I would have had the same question, but then a different question instead. You said you were planning on integrating with poetry. Um, with regards to building your worker environments. Yeah. Are you planning on building the same integration for the Conda slash Mamba ecosystem as well? Yeah, so the ev eventually, yeah, that's the, the plan to do it for everything. Yeah. Very nice, yeah. thank you. Some questions back there? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering when you called um, your CSV in your cluster, you use uh, S3FS. I was wondering if it was downloading it to your machine and then uploading it again to the cluster, or is it going directly to your cluster? Um, so in, in the other notebook, you mean? Yeah, with S3. Yeah. Uh, my, my cluster is running in AWS, so they just it does not go through my local client. It cool. goes straight to the cluster. Yeah. One more question back there. Um, beforehand, you mentioned that uh, the call or the compute graphs are not limited to a MapReduce kind of scheme or pattern. Could you name an example of an application that uh, doesn't lend itself to MapReduce and can be solved with Dask? Sure. Um, I know that a lot of our uh, customers in financial services uh, use uh, Dask Delayed to build um, things for, I uh, think, Backtesting, things like that. I, I don't do any of that uh, analysis myself, so I'm hesitant to say a whole lot more. Sorry, I can't see your face so it's <laughs> uh, uh, than that. Um, but I know that that's one common application. Thank you.
Uh, maybe a question. These yeah. com compute graphs, they all start from the read CSV call. So I guess it's reading the data every time you call a new graph. Is there some way of caching an intermediate operation if you want to start from the same point multiple times? Absolutely, yeah. So you could uh, run DDF2, not persist. Um, I'm not going to do that. I mean, when you're wor working locally, that's not as useful because it's just it's, it would be the same as calling compute. It's storing it in local memory. Uh, but when working on a cluster, uh, this can be uh, helpful to uh, say, okay, the result uh, uh, of this uh, computation, store it in, in cluster memory. Okay, and can you also persist to disk? To uh, that's com uh, yeah, that's compute. I mean, that's, uh, that, that would load it to disk. Oh, you mean uh, persist to disk? I guess so, yes. Uh, it's not something I've ever done myself, but okay. I'm sure Thanks. it's possible. Yeah. How are folks doing on the exercises? Anyone? Questions? Um, you said that the uh, plan is optimized, right? The task plan. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way to cut up the plan in two, such that the first part and the second part are optimized individually? Optimized for? So um, for the order of tasks, maybe, or the order of execution of the tasks, uh, such that you have some grip on how the optimization goes. Sure. Uh, I would definitely think that's possible with task delayed. So a task data frame uh, gives you less flexibility on how the task graph is built, but that means you also need to think about it less. So uh, that's the trade-off with using the high level versus the low level. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks. For sure. All right, um, let's run through uh, the examples and the exercises. Um, if we want to get the total of the non-canceled flights uh, in our data set, um, we do something that should be familiar to most people who work in Pandas um, and add the compute call at the end. So we negate the canceled column and sum that. We can get the total of the non-canceled flights by airport this way, um, yeah, and then the solutions sh for these uh, should load by themselves. Um, if there are no questions about this, basically the point of this is uh, that for a large portion of the Pandas uh, API, uh, it'll look exactly the same, except you're adding the compute call at the end. Now a little performance tip on when to call compute. Um, you see this a lot with people who start with Dask are so used to getting results straight away, because that's what Pandas does, that they uh, compute all the time. But remember that you're interrupting the building of a task graph anytime you call um, compute. So it's a little bit um, like cooking a recipe and eating the ingredients while you're cooking. It's like, yeah, it might taste good, but you'll miss out on the total effect. And um, so in, in this case, um, Let's try and compute the mean and standard deviation for the departure delay of all the non-canceled flights. Uh, we can define all of them. So we get the non-canceled flights, the mean delay, and the standard deviation of the de delay. And we can compute each of these separately. Take about three seconds. Now, alternatively, uh, we can see uh, that um, there's some shared um, data for these two um, results that we're trying to uh, compute, which is the non-canceled uh, variable. So if there's a way for us to construct a task graph to say, hey, actually, instead of doing those separately, join them together, so a little bit the opposite of what you're saying, um, you could import Dask and use dask.compute again. So this is a little bit, this is the lower level uh, API. And this will run in about half the time. Yeah, this is, all, this is not legible anymore. But basically, uh, things are getting shared, arrows. That's the point of this diagram. Um, yeah, I, me I mentioned a little bit already, uh, based on Juan's question also, uh, about the distributed scheduler. Um, so earlier in the notebook, uh, we created this and then connected to a cluster object, which was our remote cluster. 
If we just say n workers equals eight, this will create a local Dask cluster. So there'll be a Dask scheduler process and then eight Dask workers um, that will then do your Dask computations. This will give you a hyperlink to the Dask dashboard. And let's see, fingers crossed. If we run a group by, there we go. That was very fast. <laughs> uh, but basically, um, this is the dashboard that gives you insight into the computations uh, that are running on your cluster. Let's close the client for this notebook. This is the end of the data frame section. Any questions before we move on? Would you? Uh, yeah. uh, it's been a while I've been used uh, some, something similar to that, so it was Spark, and it looks very similar to now. Um, maybe one thing that was different, and I wonder if that's just because I was a beginner Spark user or not, but the way you computed the mean and the standard deviation, is that something really like specific to the way Dask built this compute graph, or would, the, would, it, would it be also something that would be as parallelized if we're, I was doing it with Spark? Because I from what I remember, I would have, have to do some persist in some places and maybe uh, do things in a way that it actually shares some computations, but I wonder if I'm just wrong there. Yeah, uh, I'm not a uh, avid Spark user myself either, so I uh, will preface my answer that, with that. Um, but I do know that Dask offers more flexibility. Um, so I, I, I don't know how to do this exact computation in Spark, uh, so I can't fully answer your question. Um, but the two um, main distinguishing features between Dask and Spark are that Dask is pure Python, um, so no JVM uh, and, and Scala error messages, things like that. Um, and Dask offers more flexibility uh, at the lower level to build your own task graphs. Yeah. Thank you. And if everyone, ever, anyone knows for Spark? How well does it handle joining two data frames? Yeah, um, quite well. Depends on a few things. Um, joining a large data frame to a small data frame um, is uh, quite performant. If uh, I mean, yeah, when you're joining in a distributed setting, you often have to shuffle the data. It gets pretty, uh, pretty intensive. So Dask handles it well. Uh, I would say um, it's up to you. Uh, to figure out whether it's the right choice or not. Um, usually it involves setting the index, um, and that's, that's, uh, that's especially heavy, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but to, to uh, continue my answer, like the, the API is, is uh, comparable to pandas, so it's a, a dot merge and then the um, thing, yeah. All right. We have half an hour left, so let's um, jump into the machine learning uh, notebook. Um, this is a notebook that will uh, illustrate three things. Uh, we will look at using Dask uh, as the back end uh, to scikit-learn algorithms. Um, so with the job lib library, uh, using Dask to do things like hyperparameter search uh, on a cluster. Um, we will look at uh, using DaskML to do actual, like, distributed parallel uh, algorithms, and we will look at um, Dask's integration with XGBoost. Um, so, start with a quick um, overview. Um, well, by now you all have memorized this diagram. Um, quick overview of scikit-learn for people. Uh, I think a lot of people raised their hands, uh, but basically uh, we're going to. Um, just a quick refresher on how scikit-learn works. Um, in this case, we're making a, a synthetic classification uh, data set, storing those in X and Y variables. variables. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, X and Y are NumPy arrays. We import the model that we want to train. We instantiate it, and then we fit our model on using the X and Y data. 
and we can then um, inspect attributes of this model and the accuracy. If we uh, want to improve this model, we can do something called hyperparameter optimization with something like grid search uh, CV. We define, in this case, four parameters that we want to uh, train our model on to see which combination is the best. We pass the grid search CV, our estimator, the grid of the parameters, um, and say how many cro uh, cross-validations uh, we want to do. And we fit that. And scikit-learn, at least in this default setting, will do that sequentially. So we're doing eight fits, and as you see, each one will follow the next. takes about 16 seconds, and once that's done, we can get the best parameters and the best score. Not a huge improvement from what we had before, but at least now we know we've tested some parameters. There could be a lot more parameters to test. And if we are, I mean, this is working with you know, a tiny data set and using four parameters, it's really just kind of a, a toy problem, right? In, in the real world, you're, you're likely using a lot more data and you'll want to try a lot more parameters. It would be great if we could train each one in parallel, because it's just the model being fit on the parameters. There's no exchange of information between each. Right? So this is an embarrassingly parallel problem. Scikit-learn has a uh, backend for uh, parallelism called joblib. So any est Scikit-learn estimator that exposes the end jobs keyword can be trained in parallel. So in this case, I would spe specify minus one, which will uh, use the maximum available cores to train this in parallel. Again, eight fits. It won't show them sequentially because they're happening um, together. But it trains in about half the time. No task here yet. This is just pure scikit-learn. Now, this is great. And my machine locally could handle this and do some speed up. Um, but we're still working with four parameters and a small data set. If we were to increase the amount of data or the amount of par parameters that we're interested in, or both, um, running this locally on eight cores might start to become less performant. And uh, we might get impatient, and we might want to run it faster. And this is one way to use Dask to speed up your machine learning problems is to uh, specify Dask as the backend for joblib. So wherever Dask is running is where uh, the parallelism will happen through joblib. So here we will create a local client um, with eight workers, eight cores. We'll define some more parameters to make this a little bit more interesting. Well, that import joblib. So this is the library that um, talks to this keyword behind the scenes. And then create a context manager and set the backend to be Dask. And we'll then fit this model. This is now using the Dask cluster. But actually, I'm cheating here. And anyone who can spot it, um, should let me know. What is the difference between what I'm doing here? I've created a Dask cluster on my machine with eight workers. And here, other than the number of parameters. I've changed the number of parameters, but this is minus one, which is using how many cores? Everything. Sorry? Everything. Everything, which is eight. And here I've created a Dask cluster using eight cores. So this is exactly the same. So actually, Dask is not giving you anything here because you're running locally. So that doesn't make much of a difference. But if we were now to import coiled and say, connect to the running cluster. I'm just going to pull the name. This is why I should have given it a better name. Um, this is connecting to the cluster that's already running. 
even though we spawned it in another Python process. And instead of saying n, one, n workers, I will now put in the cluster here. Actually, first, let me close this client. Now, from this point on, any DAS computations will be run on my coiled cluster and not locally. So when we create this now, so this ran in 26.5 seconds locally. This is now going to run on my cluster. Run a bit faster. We've got 20 workers, each with 16 gigabytes of RAM. It's up to you if for this use case it was worth spinning up a cluster in the cloud and paying for that. Probably not, right? It's eight seconds difference. Um, but just to illustrate that um, nothing about the code has changed. You've just uh, pointed Dask to a different uh, cluster um, to run remotely instead of locally. Any questions about this before we move on? Um, yeah, I was just wondering how coiled or you can use Dask uh, alongside some MLOps frameworks like SageMaker because they have their own APIs for these various um, uh, estimators that you may be using. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I mean, I'm not sure how, I mean, uh, you could run this in a SageMaker notebook, but you're asking, I think your question is something else. Well, so... You're, you're calling like the scikit-learn estimators here via the Dask uh, APIs, whereas SageMaker will call the same via their own APIs. Can you integrate the two together? So I'm not using any Dask API here. Okay. This is just pure scikit-learn. All I'm doing is uh, um, um, moving the parallelism to a remote cluster. Okay. And you can do that from within a SageMaker notebook yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. If you, as long as your SageMaker notebook is authorized with Coiled. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, moving on to um, Dask ML, which is a library that re-implements scikit-learn algorithms to run in parallel um, on a Dask, um, working with Dask data frames and Dask arrays as input. Um, so this will look. Uh, a lot like the scikit-learn API, but it's no longer um, the exact scikit-learn API. It's wrappers around that. Um, so we're making, um, again, a synthetic um, data set here, now a, a regression data set. Before we saw if we called X, it was a NumPy array. Now that's a Dask array, uh, which will not give us any contents because it's uh, uh, lazily uh, uh, constructed. We'll then instantiate a linear regression model. This is a, the Dask ML version. Again, it'll look and feel very much the same. We can fit this model. This should, yeah, well, that's fitting on our cluster. And if you think, this is taking a while. I wish this was faster. Um, I'd say you're a little impatient because it's 28 seconds, but if you must, um, it's quite easy to scale up the cluster that you're running on. Um, so now this will scale up to 100. It'll take some time for those resources to get um, to come online, so you probably won't beat the time that you just did. Um, but if you're working with Things that are taking a week or a day, or you know, this uh, scaling up your cluster um, can be one way to uh, improve the runtime. All right. Um, let's see if I think I promised the. Yeah. Right. So this is normally I'd kind of mess around with the order a little bit. Um, normally, I would run that linear regression locally first and then show the speed up with coiled, but 
we were already running on coiled, so I'll skip that section. Um, and um, to talk about XG Boost, so XG Boost is not within the, the scikit-learn API, it's its own thing. Um, we, DaskML started out building a, a, a DaskML wrapper around XG Boost. Um, that was found so popular and effective that XGBoost decided to uh, upstream or integrate that into their, um, into their library. Um, so you can now access uh, parallelized uh, versions of XGBoost uh, that run on Dask clusters. Um, if you're familiar with XGBoost, there's, there's two APIs. There's the one that, that follows the scikit-learn model of fit and uh, uh, train, and then there's the more uh, kind of default native XGBoost uh, API, uh, where normally you would do XGBoost.train, and instead of that, now you do dask.train, and this will uh, train um, in parallel on your Dask cluster. Any questions? So what about if you have a, a custom operation which you want to do on your uh, data frame, um, like uh, sometimes you can apply like a lambda function uh, on uh, a column, and if it gets split between different machines, the actual operation might be in conflict with the way that the chunks are distributed. So is there a way to specify um, like how, how like a certain interface that I can plug into to specify yeah. my, uh, sure. my function. Yeah, I th um, so you, you want to apply custom functions to your Dask data frame. Right. Correct. So um, there's a method called map partitions, which will map a function over all of the partitions. And you can pass any function that can act on a pandas object, because each partition is a pandas data frame. And it will work like a MapReduce kind of thing, or? Uh, it will, it will, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it will map, um, I mean, let's, let's do it live. What do you want to do with this data frame? Well, I don't know, I just, you know, just. Uh, um, yeah. Can you do like a uh, Yeah, I'm not sure I could do that live on the spot right now, but. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't think I can do that live on the spot right now. But, uh, like some, sorry? Like of? I mean, yeah, I think both both of these are implemented in the Dask API, so that's why I'm thinking you could you could use them. Uh, like k-means or uh, something. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it coming, guys. Keep it coming. <laughs> Not feeling the pressure at all. Um, I'm going to quit here and not embarrass myself any further. Um, map partitions is a great way to map functions over pandas data frames that are the partitions of your DAS data frame. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. How would you recommend uh, implementing, for example, TensorFlow or PyTorch uh, or similar libraries over Dask? Yeah, um, let's see. TensorFlow I don't have experience with. Uh, PyTorch, um, we have an example uh, here. Um, yeah, there's, uh, that gets you uh, into the kind of lower level API of Dask delayed, which means it's a lot more hands-on and involved. Um, uh, you can scatter uh, the data to your cluster and then um, uh, pass those delayed uh, objects uh, into PyTorch. Um, I would recommend taking a look at this, this blog to, to do you have uh, look to, at it. Do you have to get into the lower level API of PyTorch as well? Or do you know that? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. No. no. Okay, thanks. All right, um, let's go to notebook four then. This digs in a little deeper to the lower level API DAS delayed. Um, going over this before, we saw it, we have the increment and the add functions that are running uh, sequentially that we can then 
um, wrap and dust the lid uh, to build a task graph. Right? Things could run in parallel. Um, it's a very simple example, but um, a slightly more involved example is how to parallelize a for loop, right? A for loop, in, uh, especially in this case, is sequential. Um, we have a list of eight numbers for i in that list. We will increment um, i and append the results. This will take eight seconds because there's that sleep function in each for loop, which will sleep for one second, and we'll get the total result. Um, I will give you all five minutes to try this exercise. Um, I think this one especially is worth doing because it really gets you to think about, okay, where is the task graph being constructed? Um, I got this wrong the first five times I tried it because my intuition was to do it differently. So I'm curious uh, if this um, is, makes more sense to, to other folks in the room. So I will give you... Um, Five minutes uh, to do that exercise. Ten more? Okay. Uh, we have ten more minutes, so I will make it three minutes. Until, uh, All right. Okay, three minutes are up. Um, how many of you were able to solve this? One? Okay. Um, so, not sure what your intuition was. Um, 
But for me, I, I think the first time I tried this, I just, I think I just put a delay here. It's just like, that, that, that must work, right? You just kind of wrap it around and then it'll figure everything out. Um, that doesn't work. Um, but what does work is wrapping the ink function with task delayed. And uh, what's happening here is that, for me, what, what the kind of the, the, when I reflected on it a little bit, I thought, okay, I think the for loop needs to get parallelized. So I want every iteration to run in parallel, so I must sort of maybe create a function that does the for loop and then delayed, wrap delayed around that. Uh, but what's actually happening is the for loop is not being parallelized. So we're creating a das delayed object eight times. And uh, the results of that are then also wrapped in das delayed. And so when we visualize it, we will now see each of these instances of increment being run uh, par in parallel. Those are aggregated uh, in a sum. And this will now run in one second. I realize that this is, very, in a way, a very banal like, uh, illustration of what das delayed does. Like, when are you ever going to use this, right? I think that the um, trouble in explaining this is that uh, explaining it for real use cases gets extremely involved. So I chose, for this case, as it's an introductory uh, uh, tutorial, to kind of keep it really uh, illustrate the concept. And I hope I've done that um, successfully. Um, if not, please come talk to me. I, I mean, I'm always uh, uh, improving and refining this talk, so I'd love to, to get feedback on things that weren't, weren't clear. Um, but with that, uh, I will end the code part of this talk. Um, the slides that I will share, uh, that will be shared after um, the talk also include a um, real-world use case of Dask um, at Capital One, one of the big uh, US banks. Um, that's worth kind of taking a look at to see how, how big organizations use Dask uh, in production. Um, I'm r running out of time, so that's why I'm just kind of mentioning it but not going through it. Um, if you found this interesting and are curious about more material um, about Dask, um, we have a great uh, coil blog uh, which has a lot of tutorials and information about um, how to use Dask to speed up pandas and NumPy as well as kind of the lower level uh, things, and using Dask with workflow orchestration uh, tools like Airflow and Prefect. Um, if you're very curious to get more into the world of task graphs and how does Dask optimize things and can I do it better, can we do it differently, um, then our engineers write some great blogs uh, about, for example, um, doing better shuffling and, and mem memory management, so I would recommend those. Um, we have an early bird, uh, discount uh, offer for the uh, four-day Dask training. Um, if that's something you're interested in, um, check out uh, the link or come talk to me. Uh, and we're also in the process of writing uh, Dask, the definitive guide, since I think last week or two weeks ago, the early release is up. Uh, so this is literally our Google Docs as we're writing them being pushed live. Uh, it's raw. Um, have a look at it, send me feedback. Um, we're put, building this out in the open so that we can make this uh, uh, relevant to the people who want to use it. Um, you can find us here. And if there are any questions, I'll take them now. Otherwise, you can come find me later um, in the hall outside. Any last questions before we end? No? Then thank you very much.